Welcome back to the Tapes Archive podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. Please listen to episode 000, an introduction for the full backstory about this podcast series. On this episode, we have the king of punk funk, Rick James. At the time of this interview in 1997, James was 49 years old and about to start a tour to promote his first album in nine years. In the interview, James denies the rumor that he kidnapped and tortured a woman, and he says he believes the DA gave heroin to someone to testify against him. He also talks openly about his drug addiction, along with what that first hit of crack is like. To me, the biggest surprise in the interview was his negative stance on rappers. He says, and I quote, rappers need to know that their longevity on this planet is very short. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. Before we get to the interview, we have a couple of housekeeping items. If you would like to support the show, please go over to the website at thetapesarchive.com and click on the support button. On there, you'll find many ways to show your support for the show and all of them are free. While on the website, check out Mark's blog for more context of this interview and for some personal insight from Mark himself. The music that is playing is by the Budos Band. Please head over to wherever you get music and check them out. I can tell you from personal experience, this band will blow you away. While listening to the podcast, if you have any questions about the interview, please send them to thetapesarchive at gmail.com. We are going to do another podcast in the future featuring and answering your questions. One last thing, the Tapes Archive podcast is a proud member of the Osiris Podcast Network, a global community connecting passionate fans with podcasts and experiences about artists and topics you love. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. Rick? Yeah, it's Mark Allen in Indianapolis. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing fine. How are you? Great, great. Good, good. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate no it. No problem. Uh, is it an accident that you're starting the tour here? <laughs> <laughs> well, for all intents and purposes, really, the, the tour starts, I think, the first date is in Chicago, the Regal Theater. Oh, I thought that Chicago was after Indianapolis. It could be. I'm not, like I said, I'm not really, really... Yeah, I think, I think you got, like, a couple... Well, it seems to me, if I read the itinerary right, you got a couple of warm-up dates in L.A., well, and then the official first date, they're saying, okay, is October yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's, um, um, I don't know, man. It's, it's, nap time's always been really comfortable for me. Yeah? How is that? Why is that? I really don't know, but all, you know, ever, ever since I've been going there. Some of my family's there, and plus I've always had a real good, um, I've always had a real good taste for Indianapolis, you know? Okay. All right. I love nap town. <laughs> I love that name. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Nap down. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you'll be surprised, because uh, obviously you've been on the road. Well, it's it's really been built up and so. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a much bigger city than it used to be. So, but anyway, uh, the, this record I, I, I enjoyed and I found it uh, really kind of interesting. I, I read something where you're describing this as kind of like an oral movie of your life. Well, yeah, uh, it's, yeah it's 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 kind of like um, audio movie. Uh -huh. or, Urban Rap the album. Is that how you, is that, was that your plan when you started out? Well, uh, not really, because when I was down, I, when, I, when I was incarcerated, I wrote about 400 songs, a little over. And like, a, a lot of them were all different kinds. It's like, a, you know, a lot of uh, um, introspective music. Uh, all I had was an acoustic guitar. I didn't have a bass, I didn't have any drums. I wasn't allowed to participate in any kind of music at prison. It was kind of like when Mike Tyson went to uh, prison, he wasn't allowed to box. Well, they did the same thing to me in Folsom. And um, thanks be to that there was um, a person that worked in the system of the prison that really kind of felt bad that I didn't have things, you know, and that they felt that the, um, the establishment there, which is an old redneck uh, establishment of old Folsom, was really keeping me down mm -hmm. beyond what they should have been doing. Because they knew who you were? Exactly. Right. That had a lot to do with it, being black and being Rick James and all of that and, and you know, all that kind of shit. So the, uh, this person managed to get me a tape recorder where I would record, you know, I would write and I could write and write and write because I don't know how to write notes and stuff and I put it all on tape and then they would stick the tapes out for me. So that, it turned out to be a real good thing over that two year period of being there because I managed to get tons of tapes out with material on it. And uh, when I got out after listening to a lot of it, I really wanted to do a double. Or I, I, my first uh, concert was a triple album, and you know, then the record people said, "Well, that's a little, you know, that's too much for a triple album." You know, Prince did a triple album, did do very, you know, on and on and on and on. Um, so I said, "Well, a double album." Then I thought of a double album, and then. Um, 
then after really giving it a whole lot of thought, you know, and, and listening to a lot of the material, because I've always wanted to do an unplugged, an acoustical unplugged album, and I, you know, now I've got about four of them in, in you know, in, um, in, in the cans, you might say. Okay. And I didn't want to, like, lay a heavy, heavy thing on people from my entry back into the industry. I wanted to kind of ease back in with familiar, you know, familiarity, stuff that they were familiar with. <laughs> so I decided to do Urban Rhapsody, you know. I decided to go back to the streets, to the street roots. Very much like, my concept was a, a 90s street song. Okay. I think. So that's really how uh, Urban Rhapsody, the album, came into came into play. Um, and a lot of the songs are, you know, about well, about my life. But I, I didn't I didn't lay a lot of the heavy stuff down because I didn't want to really burden people's souls with all of that right on on the first album. Yeah. Are you comfortable talking about what you've been through? Sure. I don't okay. I'm with it. All right. Um, one of the lines in there, some of the some things uh, really stood out to me. One is, I think, very early on in the record, uh, you say, "I merely forgot where I truly belong." Yeah. Can you uh, can you talk about that? And what that well, means? you know, coming to Hollywood, you know, being born in Buffalo and being born in really in the in the, in the heavy ghetto, you know. Um, I mean, I, it was something I was always familiar with. You know, I was always familiar with black, always familiar with my ethnic background, always familiar with my Afrocentric culture. Um, totally familiar and totally comfortable with um, those surroundings. And I think when I started to, um, you know, when I when I made a lot of money, when I was, you know, when, you, when you're making millions of dollars and, you, and you're traveling a lot, I think you you kind of lose sight on your roots. And and I think that's what happened to me. I think when I did lose sight, I was I was so disorientated and so amazed at the things I was seeing and the things I was hearing that were really outside of really my realm. Not that I not that I don't consider myself a worldly person because I am. You know, I've been around the world a lot bunch of times and I'm very comfortable with pretty any in pretty well any culture. But the, the the real culture that I'm really comfortable with and the thing that I really understand is my blackness and the ghetto. That's what I really understand. That's what I understand. That's what I feel. That's what I cry to. That's what I cling to. That's what satisfies me. And I think during my drug addiction, I lost sight of that. I really lost sight of where I really belong, you know? And that's really pretty well what that statement sums up. Uh, I really lost sight of uh, my roots, you know? My mother passed away of cancer, and I was about four years ago, before, right before I went to prison. And I was just completely gone, you know? I was just totally drugged out all the time. And, and um, totally in, in another world. I, you know, I was in a world living in a $10 million mansion up on a hill. Locked up in a bedroom, never even seeing the outside of it. It took me, um, I don't know, three or four months before I walked out one day and found out I had a rose garden on the side of my house. And I was really isolating myself and, and and living a real kind of lonely existence, you know. And I and I did, uh, you know, nearly forgot where I where I where I belong, you know. Where I belong is making music and and um, trying to do something for myself and my people. Were you at a point in your life where you felt like you were so big that drugs wouldn't have been a problem to handle? Well, I never really thought about it. I never really thought about my addiction uh, until my accountants one day came to me and said, Rick, you know, you spent a million, you know, you spent a, you, you spent a million dollars or you spent a million and a half dollars on drugs, you know? And I said, oh, well, well, well drugs are expensive, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then they said, well, Rick, we think you have a problem. Well, well I don't think I have a problem, you know. Meanwhile, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fucking up all night, all I'm all night, all day, spending all this money on cocaine and and isolating myself. And I didn't think I, think I had a problem. People on the outside can always see that you have a problem. No one ever in the inside sees it. And everybody was so busy kissing my ass and trying to be yes men and doing this and and that no one really wanted to tell me, you know. And but in the loneliness, when I got with myself, when it was just me and Rick together, one and one, I knew I had a problem. I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong, and uh, but I didn't know how to fix it. So my accountants and lawyers sent me to a couple of rehabs. Um, even Ringo from the Beatles um, sent me to one rehab. Ringo and uh, David Crosby from Crosby, Stills and Nash, they, they sent me to a rehab once. That did them a lot of good, and uh, that didn't, uh, didn't last with me very long. I had gone about three rehabs, and none of that seemed to do any good. No, I, I, I didn't see that I had a problem, and I didn't really, I didn't really know it till it was really too late. Do you describe uh, what a crack high is like? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, 
it's, it's like it's like taking that first hit off of off a of rock or take you know I, I used to snort cocaine I used to snort cocaine and I love snorting cocaine I think I, you know I, I loved it me and my band I mean we, we, we did it for years and we never had any problem making albums and we never had any problem performing and you know snorting coke and it didn't change the atmosphere and it didn't change the ambiance of anything it's just we thought it was a hip thing to do the, you know the, the, we, we know we're making millions of dollars so we thought that was a, this was part of the culture in 1981 when I was in Chicago was when I first started smoking uh, free, free basing and when I, the, the, the first hit I ever took off a free base pipe I mean I, I fell out and I said yeah this is for me it completely took me it completely took me out of my worries and you know like a lot of heroin addicts say that when they shoot heroin but uh, you know I never really did like heroin although I did it a few times uh, crack just seemed to I mean cocaine just seemed to um just deliver me from, you know, all all the ridiculousness that I was involved in and, and the facades that I was playing and all the games that I was playing and all the bullshit. And it just seemed to, it was just me and that drug. I didn't need a woman. I didn't need anything. I just needed that drug. And it was, it's, a, it's an exhilarating, it's, it, the, the first hit is exhilarating and, and it's probably the greatest feeling I ever had next to sex. I mean, it's 500,000 times better than uh, no, in, or, in orgasm. But after that, you're chasing that high. You never get that same high after that. So you're chasing it. So you're constantly spending all this money trying to chase that high. It's easily understandable why women sell their babies and people do what they do or crack addicts. Yeah, I, I figure it must just be amazing because I mean, and I tell people, you know, boy, if I if I could be sure that I wouldn't be Len Bias, you know, I would I would do that at drug in a minute because think of all the the things that people give up for it. The high must just be incredible. Hey, it's, my, my, it's the most amazing. I, I you know what? I grew up smoking weed and stuff, and, and you know, and even in the in the sixties taking acid and all that kind of stuff, and I was able to put that stuff down. I mean, that stuff never had control of me. I mean, hey, you do it one day, you don't have it next day, fine. You don't have it three weeks and then fine. Right. When you smoke that crack when that first hit you 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 know it's the only drug in the world that that it's 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 a truity when they say one hit and 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 you're sprung out well that's that's very true <laughs> and i never ever thought there'd be a drug like that i guess that's why the government keeps it in in the ghettos and keeps it in black uh and it's well it's even in some white suburbia now but i mean it's even affected white people drugs uh crack that doesn't discriminate who 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 is you know who, who who it gets but it was the most exhilarating heavy incredible thing i'd ever felt like i said it was five hundred thousand times better than an orgasm which was uh, i should have known it was dangerous then <laughs> <laughs> I really should have. You know, I had a good friend of mine, a writer, and um, I won't mention his name, but he, you know, he writes for GQ and Rolling Stone and a lot of different people. He's a very famous writer. And me and him were having dinner once, and he, he was doing uh, an interview on crack and addicts and stuff and all that. And so he decided, to, well, the best way to do this is for him to experience it, you know? Mm -hmm. And he did. And he actually got really strung out real bad. And he told me this, and I was very shocked because I didn't know, you know? Wow. And um, he said he got strung out immediately while writing the story, you know. Man, and that's just from one, I mean, and he was, he knew he was going into experiment. Yeah, but, well, he, he didn't know, I don't think he knew it, it, it was as strong as potent a drug as, I think he thought that, that his mind and his strength and all that kind of shit, which is all horse shit, could deal with it, because it's, but, but that's not true. I don't give a fuck how smart you are or how strong you are when it comes to crack. You, it will get you. There is no two ways about it. It will get you immediately. So at the at the time that you ended up going to prison, I mean, I, I, there's no way that that going to prison is a good thing necessarily. But well, was it, it a good it, thing it was for you? It's incredible good thing. It, oh, okay. it, for me, it was a good thing. Okay. Before I went to prison, I was living up like I said in this, this house I got from Mickey Rooney, it's ten million dollar home, and it was hoes, pimps, and hoes, and everything, you know. And I had tons of hoes that were, that were working for me, and it was all kind of things, which is what Players' Way is about. And I had a lot, you know, it was women everywhere. And uh, but all that shit, you know, and when, when, you, when you're dealing with, with with that kind of element, and when you're dealing in that kind of element, you, you, it's an evil element. I mean, all that stuff about kidnapping and torture, that stuff never happened. But I mean, here's a girl who who has a pimp, who feels that they can try to get some money out of Rick James so they can support their 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 habit. So that's how that happened, and uh, that's where those stories came from. Uh, there was a girl at a hotel, and yeah, and I, and I that I had a fight with, a physical fight, because she actually kicked my pregnant girlfriend in the stomach. So I, I, I commenced to, uh, you know, I commenced to punch at her, and it got carried away. And I, yeah, it was a fight with her. But all that other stuff about kidnapping and torture—that wasn't true. 
but I did get into physical confrontation with, with another girl that worked for me who kicked my old lady in the stomach, and I got and I had been up for two weeks. And I got furiated, and I was out of my mind. It's a good story, though, don't you think? The uh, the kidnapping and the torture. It's a good story, though. Well, it's a great, story. it's a wonderful <laughs> story. I mean, it makes me seem like Marky Desaad, and, and it's very decadent, and that's almost romantic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's old, uh, like Dionysus or something, but yeah. unfortunately, it didn't happen. I mean, uh. I, if I ever do a movie, I guess I'll put it in there just to make it look interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because when I read it myself, I go, damn. <laughs> oh, I did all this for sex? God, I mean, as much sex as I was getting, I mean, I was like turning women away from the door. I mean, I never had any problem with sex. There's a uh, there's an old uh, Warren Zevon song where he talks about being a drug addict, and he said, he picked up Rolling Stone, he said, I read things I didn't know I'd done. It sounded like a lot of fun. Did, did that ever happen? Warren Zevon. Oh, that's you know, right. Yeah, I love that line. Did that ever happen to you? Have you read things that you that, Well, I guess this would have been one of them. Well, yeah, that was one of them. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things that I supposedly had done and, and shit over the years, I mean, I can't remember if I did them or not. Mm -hmm. But they started to sound great. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the orgies and a lot of the women that I've been with and a lot of all the other crazy stuff. I mean, that stuff sounded like a wonderful shit. I mean, it sounded like, yeah, God, was I there? Mm -hmm. Did I do that? I mean, a lot of stuff that's been written about me, yeah, it's true, but I mean, these cops in Hollywood wanted me so bad. I mean, if you know anything about my case, you, you, you know that the DA even, you know, they planted, they gave a girl heroin in jail to testify against me. I got a lawsuit right now getting ready to pin against the whole DA system for that shit. I mean, they gave a girl drugs in jail to lie. They schooled a girl to lie in front of a camera. Uh, you know, it, 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 this went on and on. I mean, that is such a great story. Now, when you when you read that, you go, it's that that's going to blow your mind. What they did to go and to what they actually did to nail me, or to try to nail me. Anyway, I ended up going to jail for a cocaine and one charge of assault. It, so they wanted you just because it looks good when you get oh, yeah. a famous person. Oh no, yeah, yeah, they wanted me. I mean, and not to not not to harp on color or anything, but it, but it, 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 it is a race thing. I mean, yeah. it did boil down to that. Here's this black running around with long braids with all these gorgeous white movie stars and women flaunting, smoking weed on stage, making millions of dollars, running, jumping out of limousines, <laughs> eating espargos, drinking champagne, and throwing bottles out of the limousine. Uh, Let's get that nigger, you know? <laughs> that nigger's on the hit list. Yeah. You know, they didn't like it, so, you know. But anyway, you, so you you end up in prison. This turns out to be a good thing. Yeah, I, I you know, Mark, I thought it was a, I thought it was a curse. I said, oh God, I'm cursed. You know, this is like oh, this is a terrible thing. Here I am with all these real criminals, these killers and rapists and baby and child molesters, and all this shit. But you know what? It turned out to be a great thing because all the rehabs didn't give me what prison gave me. Pri prison took away my freedom on a serious level, and it really put me in the belly of the beast. It really put me around. Uh, I think out of three thousand cops who worked there, maybe five or ten were black. It was a racist pen. Uh, it, it was, it's an old institution. It's like a French Bastille or something. It's really old and it's bricks and it looks like a uh, fucking castle. And um, it's full of racism and it's full of hatred. You know, the Mexicans, uh, the Aryan Brotherhood, uh, the Crips and Bloods, uh, and on and on and on. The, the, the good thing about it is, is that a lot of these guys in this prison uh, had a love thing for me because they had grew up with my music and they had done time. I had made their time easier. Right. So I had a blanket of love when I was there. I mean, nobody was out prisoners. Uh, anybody who, nobody was out to kill me. Although I, I had heard there was a contract out on me, you know. And, you know, uh, everybody kind of looked after me. But the CEOs, the, the, the officers were the ones I was worried about because those are the ones that really wanted me. Hmm. Okay. Um, you make reference to uh, people watching you. Uh, somebody's watching. Or somebody's yeah. watching you. Do you, do you yeah. really think that? Is that still going on? On the album. Well, somebody's watching you. Somebody, I used to think about in prison all the time because I was I was under such scrutiny. I was under, you know, I was under such scrutiny on a daily basis, 24 hours a day. You know, the police all wanted to bust me. You know, they all was hoping I'd do drugs in prison, which I didn't. Um, every, you know, inmates were looking at me all the time because everybody, you know, there's Rick James. You know, it was like a celebrity thing. Mm -hmm. 
So I always felt eyes on me all the time. I never could do my time peacefully. But even when I got out, I find that I'm still under scrutiny. I got you know, my parole officer, you know, everybody else watching me, everybody wanting what I'm going to do and all this kind of shit. So that, that song really didn't come out of paranoia. That song just came out of uh, true awareness. You no, know, that's about everybody. I mean, somebody's watching you, somebody's watching everybody. Yeah, I mean, you sound really good and really uh, and really lucid. I'm taking it that you're not intending to fuck up again. Am I right about no, that? No, no, no. Yeah. You know, but if you know anything about drug addicts, you know, relapse is all part of recovery. I'm hoping, I pray to God every day, man, that I just stay straight. And I just, you know, because right now I'm, you know, I got my family, I got my five-year-old son I'm raising, my old lady, we got a new house. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about life, man. I'm excited about this. I'm not getting any older. I'm in my late 40s. I'm not getting any older. I want to tour. I want to make more albums. I want to do it before. I want to leave some kind of a record, at least for my son, or some kind of epitaph that, that that's good. And, you know, so I don't leave out of this planet with Rick. Rick James was a son of a bitch, you know? You mean you mean in his lifetime, right? Because, I mean, and, you've and, done a whole lifetime's worth of work. Right? In his lifetime. Yeah, okay. okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, you spent a lot of time on the record, which I think is interesting, reminiscing about the good old days, talking about how you never had to worry about gunshots and this and that. And yeah. uh, Do you look at the way the world is now and just think, what the hell happened? I think it's crazy, man. I, th I think this, this is the most insane times that I've ever seen, man. Um, I've never seen so much black on black violence. I've never seen so many uh, untalented people make so much money so fast. <laughs> Doing it on, um, I mean, the whole young generation. I mean, we got a whole generation of children out there, especially black children, who, number one, don't have any fathers, who, number two, are slinging dope and driving BMWs and everything. And everybody's got a fucking beeper living in the ghetto, like they're doctors and lawyers. And, uh, and, 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 they're, and they're all doing it under these scandalous motives. And then you have these songwriters that are coming out, these rappers, which I'm not putting rappers down. A lot of them I really like, and a lot of them are saying good things. Talking about bitches and hoes and niggers and saying all this kind of shit and I don't look at that as good for our people and it's like people winning Grammys that, 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 that sample you know me and everybody else and they're not even making real music and it's just insane it's just insane and when I wrote Good Old Days you know it was just like I just had to say something about I had to put something on the album that, that just in, in the 80s and the 70s man you know we could go to a concert you never had to worry about being stabbed or shot or, or trouble you know what I mean and people got together for fun and love, which is what I'm trying to, when I come to Indianapolis, that's what I want to see. I want to see people come out, everyone come out for a love uh, thing, man. Just come out and enjoy yourself, and let's go back to the times when life was simple. Not, you know, go in and be worried about if you got a gun and being searched down for a strap, and uh, well, man, it, it's incredible. Yeah, and yes, it does bother me. It bothers me. It bothers me. As a matter of fact, it's, it's even bothered me to the point I thought of moving to, uh, moving to the Ivory Coast in Africa, or or Belgium or somewhere to get my son out of this environment because I don't even want him growing up to this. Yeah, well, if you're living in 818, you're, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a great environment to raise a kid, is it? No, not at all. It's scary. Um, uh, the, the world is, uh, the landscape of music's changed a lot since your last record came out and the, the market seems to have a really short memory. I'm wondering when you first came out and said, I want to uh, I want to make a record and uh, I want to get back into it, what, what kind of reaction did you get from from record companies. From record companies, yeah. are paranoid. They're all paranoid. Mm -hmm. Whether I was going to get high or not, what's it this or that, has he changed, what's he like, what does he look like, this and that, how's he sound, all of this. Will, will you make a demo? I just sold over 45 million records and they want me to make a demo. Mm -hmm. I was pissed. So I said, fuck this. Uh, I got really frustrated. Uh, you know, because people forget really easy, you know? I mean, there was a time when I supported companies, you know? Right. I mean, they forget Mary Jane Girls, Eddie Murphy. They forget, uh, you know, the, the, the tours and, and the albums and the Grammy Awards and all this. They forget all that. All they remember is that, hey, he's out, you know, he's out of prison. Is he getting high? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? Okay, well, that's all fine and dandy. I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's natural for, for the cause. But still, they, it, it just got to be so crazy. I decided, well, I'm going to invest my own money and I'm going to make put my own album up. So I, I started that and this guy, Joe Iscro, who I became partners with on this first album. And um, this is like a fuck you album to record companies. <laughs> Because this is something, for the first time in my entire life, Mark, I own my own master. And it's a great feeling, you know what I mean? Yeah. Motown doesn't own it, Warner Brothers doesn't own it, Barry Gordy doesn't own it. I own my own master.
Center. And Urban Rhapsody is, is my first step in being independent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, we, and I did it, and we did it all ourselves, you know, we, we, graphics, everything. Uh, I paid for it ourselves. And I take it you're going to go out there and sell this thing because... And I'm going to go out and sell it, and I'm going to go out and try to, you know, and give people some real music uh, without all that crap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you mentioned sampling before, and uh, obviously, you, you know, uh, Super Freak was sampled into one of the biggest singles of all time. What do you think of that? I think of the, the the checks were great. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, MC Hammer, you know, uh, I, don't, he, he, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think he went a little nuts thinking that he could actually sample a song and get such a big record and that he could uh, carry on that, that he was creative. I mean, I don't know what he, what, what he was thinking. <laughs> uh, rappers need to know that their longevity on this planet is, is, is very short. And if anything, I, I, I would tell rappers they need to learn how to play instruments and deal with it with real instruments. But yeah. sampling, you know, and pretty soon when the FCC starts coming down and, and you know, and it becomes a government thing, it's going to be hard for them to say or, or do anything without, a, you know, a bunch of trouble, mm -hmm. one way or the other. Yeah. It's... I mean, I, I enjoy the fact that MC, because MC Hammer, at least one thing about it, uh, Hammer, he, he was a clean rapper. He didn't, he didn't offend anybody. Right. Right. But I didn't really mind that. Yeah. I take it then that it was no surprise to you that his career, you know, wound oh, no, up being no. nothing. You know? <laughs> no, it was no surprise at all. Matter of fact, when he came to Buffalo in my hometown and I saw him have like seven or eight trucks, yeah. I knew he was through. <laughs> <laughs> I looked on stage and it was like a hundred dancers, and I said, "Oh no, I don't know. He's he's he, he's just lost it." Yeah, yeah. And these rappers seem to be repeating the same mistakes. I mean, huh? they, you, you don't get the impression that these rappers are learning from each other. Like, no, you know, no, no, man. You know, I, I don't. Have, I can't really say anything about it because I don't know. I, I think they're all on some kind of strange drug, man. <laughs> I think they're all like, you know, they get a little taste of success and and they just go off the deep end. I mean, they'll go into a Rick James song or George Clinton, and they actually think they're creative. Well, they're creative because they know the music. You know, at least they, they spend a little time learning about the music compared to so many well, a lot kids of them out do. there. Yeah. Warren G's and DJ Quick, mm -hmm. Teddy Riley. You know, I mean, there's a lot of them men that study those schools. They really do great jobs that are really creative. But then there's a lot of them who are just out there gar doing garbage. Yeah. And I guess the kids don't, you know, I guess that's what they want to hear. That's what they're buying. But unfortunately, all that garbage, you know, unfortunately that they can't go out and even do a concert. Well, yeah, and even that, I mean, you go, you go I, have you seen any rap? live um yeah i mean it, very rarely is it done it's, well it's very strange yeah i mean it, it's like they stand there the kids stand there and it doesn't really seem like they're having a good time they're just there you know what i'm saying right they watch for yeah, a bit they're just watching and, and and looking around and wondering if they're gonna get shot <laughs> Uh, but they also say they, they look around and it's like they never applaud at the end of songs. No, they don't Isn't applaud. The and, 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 the, and the rapper gets up and he holds his dick in his hand and he walks back and forth swinging his hands. And, <laughs> and, 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 I don't understand it, man. I don't know. Maybe I'm too old. Maybe this generation gap, you know. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing something here. Yeah, just, uh, just uh, a couple uh, other uh, quick things if I can. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Oh my God. You got lost or something. It, I don't know. It, well, I don't know. When, people, when you come out and people see you playing an instrument, I mean, that's, that, that just makes me Man, when, I go see, when I go see groups now from the 80s and 70s, it, it warms my heart so much. I went and saw Larry Graham and the, the other day. Larry Graham and right. uh, Earth Fire, and I saw War not long ago, and Brothers Johnson and stuff. And it just, an average white man. And I just felt so good, man. It's, it's something inside of me just got really warm to see these groups again and to really hear real music. And I'm, and, and I'm, I'm wanting that same thing for people that, that, that come to see us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just a few other quick things. One is, um, somebody asked me to ask you if you still do Lucy's rap. Lucy's rap? Yeah. We, we're going to do a little bit of it. Okay. Yeah, we're going to do a lot of old songs. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we, it's going to be a real concert. I mean, it's going everything is going to be, even the tempo of the songs are going to be right. Okay. I mean, it's not going to be like the old days, just us running through stuff. We're going to actually give a, a real show of music. Okay. Um, the Rolling Stone Encyclopedia of Rock, the entry on you ends by saying that there was a rumor that you were going to write your autobiography. Have I you? did. You did, okay. Uh, it is a, it, there's a few paragraphs. There's there's some things that have to be finished, but it'll be coming out probably right after this tour. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And are you calling it? Uh, well, memoirs with Super Freak. Memoirs, that's what they said it was going to be yeah. called. Okay. And uh, I'll be working on it with David Ritz, hopefully. Okay. A lot of times it's written that you first started your career with Neil Young. Yeah. And, and you know, I never read any details of that. Can you tell me what that was like? Well, that was in the village in the 60s. Um, 
I had a group called the Minor Birds. Right. And really, it was half of the Steppenwolf. Nick St. Nicholas, who um, formed Steppenwolf, was um, in the group. And uh, Goldie McJohn was the keyboard player, who was also a keyboard player for Steppenwolf. And we kind of broke up after a couple of years. And a guy named Bruce Palmer came and took his place. And Neil Young, which became the Buffalo Springfield and Crosby Stills and Nash. But um, that was during the village in the 60s. You know, hang around. You know, that was when Joni Mitchell and all of us were playing around the same coffee houses and David Clay Thomas, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and Gordon Lightfoot, and and on and on, you know? Yeah. Those were great times. Um, where is that music? Do you have any idea? Is there anything recorded? I don't it? know, man. I would love to find some of it. Yeah. I'd love to find some of it. Oh, oh that, that, uh, the, the people you're mentioning in the crowd that you're running in, I mean, they're all pretty cool people, but that's an extremely white scene. How did you... Yeah, uh, yeah it, 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 it was, but I mean, that, that's what I was AWOL for the Navy, and I had to hide out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You want, did I went you to Canada and I went to the village. Uh -huh. I was, you know, and I happened just to meet these musicians, and that's when I started my life in the music industry. Wow! Did walking they? down the street and uh, hello? Yeah, I'm still meeting uh, some of the guys from the band, yeah. Darth and Levon Helm and them, and um, them taking me around. I was in my sailor suit. They took me around the coffee houses. I ended up singing in a coffee house, and the group asked me to join them. But those were great days for me, and those are great. You know, uh, music has no color to me. I mean, I like country western. I love classical. I love jazz. I love Brazilian music. I mean, I love all. I love folk music. I still listen to two, uh, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, Bob Dylan, and all those things. You know? yeah, since you are, you know, the the master of funk, you know, nobody expects that, that you know you're hanging around with Joni Mitchell. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, me and Joni, we, yeah, we kind of laugh at that. Yeah, it is. But nobody expected Joni to, to be such a great jazz artist either. That's that, yeah, good point. Good point. For another story I'm working on, I've been asking everybody I interview, if you became the overlord of pop music, what would be the first thing you would change? What would be the first thing I'd change? Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a, that's, that's a hard question. Uh, I, I, I change a lot of uh, I change a lot of content and, and, and lyrics. I wouldn't you know I wouldn't let uh, I, uh, I would want music where a three or four year old or five year old six year old would be able to listen to it without being offended. Um, anything else going on that you want to mention? We covered a lot of ground. Oh, just the tour. I'm really excited about the tour. I'm really excited about Indianapolis, man. I, you know I, I want people in their 30s and 40s to show up strong in Indianapolis and show uh, unity and show love and show that we can't have concerts without violence and that we can have love and that uh, the funk still lives. And for all those people who uh, are evoking devils about Rick James or player hating, or as, as they call it these days, stay, keep your asses at home. All I want is people that, 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 that want to see a good show, want to hear great music, want to go back to the times where simple and when people were loving and caring. Because that's what the concert and that's what this tour is all about. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best, man. I hope everything works out. Thank I hope you, you stay much. healthy and uh, it's good to have you back. Hey, thank you, man. You take care, Rick. I'll I see will. you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.